I suppose uh, just a, the most recent thing that just brings up the date. Tonight, the, uh, the NAFIT committee, which looks after the COVID restrictions in 26 counties, have sent a letter to the government uh, to say that they are advising me to move into what was called level five, which is the highest rate of lockdown, which means all of Ireland, well, sorry, the 26 counties will move into the, a very restricted form. So it'll be, if it's accepted by the government, we'll be back into a full lockdown, all businesses closed, five kilometre radius for travel. Uh, and the rates in the north are actually higher, per 100,000. Then, So you'll imagine there will be an all-island reciprocal version of this if it's accepted by the government. We're currently at level three and they're, they're proposing going to level five. So, I mean, that is full lockdown territory where we were in March. So a very worrying position to be in. Um, I suppose that's that's the context for everything that we've been doing. It's the reason why we're doing Zoom meetings and the reasons why I haven't been able to travel to Canada to see us all in person. But everything else continues on in the background, including the politics of, for today. And just to bring us up to speed, I, I mean, I... The last time I spoke to you, is we, I said the, the big issues we were facing were Brexit and legacy. And those, those issues haven't gone away and, in fact, have intensified. What has become apparent to anybody looking in is this, Ari, this British government has no care. I don't know. For the Good Friday Agreement. You need chat room. There's no care for the, the people of Ireland, no care for their rights, no care for what, what's happening. And that's why it's about Brexit or why it's about legacy. This is a government that has no skin in the peace process game. And in fact, the people who are leading British government policy opposed the uh, Good Friday Agreement. So people like Michael Gove uh, actually spoke against and quite extensively. He actually likened the Good Friday Agreement to Nazi appeasement. And this is a guy who's now in control of implementing Brexit. And I'll just go through then to bring us up to bring us up to speed on where we are with Brexit and things have moved at a pace. Uh, three weeks ago, Michael Barnier, Michel Barnier, gave a report, and he says there was three outstanding issues which the British government hadn't moved on. There were fisheries, state aid, and dispute resolution. He also highlighted in that report that issues relating to Ireland were moving slowly, but they were moving. Uh, immediate, and at, at the same week, bizarrely, Arlene Foster had been out, and she was advocating that they needed to move on to move on with what was called the uh, withdrawal agreement, and put together the mechanisms, the legislation, so the businesses in the north would have the certainty. So the withdrawal agreement was not politically contentious in the north. That all happened, this is how quickly that moved. That, that happened on the Thursday, the Friday, and then on the Sunday night, the British government started briefing that they were going to bring in this thing called the Internal Markets Bill, which they first claimed was to clarify the agreements. And then whenever they got up to speak about it, and Brandon Lewis, the British Secretary of State for the North, got up to speak about it, he made it very clear that this agreement would breach international law and acknowledge that in terms of the withdrawal agreement. And it's worth noting that the legislation also breaches the Good Friday Agreement in a number of ways. Uh, the first one is it was brought in without any consultation with the parties in the North or with the Irish government. That's a breach of, if you like, the practice of the Good Friday Agreement, but it's also a very obvious breach of Strand 3 of the Good Friday Agreement, which means issues or concern are meant to be debated and discussed between the two governments before they proceed. So it's a breach of that. There's a breach of strand two of the Good Friday Agreement because the outworking of this means it would undermine all Ireland working. There's a breach of strand one because it gives British government ministers powers to interfere in what were devolved responsibilities, issues which were the responsibility of the executive in the North. And that's not just an issue for the North, that's also an issue for Scotland and Wales. And I suppose, lastly, the other fundamental principles of the Good Friday Agreement are based on rights equality, the incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights. The Northern Human Rights Commission and Equality Commission jointly produced a briefing paper on Thursday and made it clear that the provisions in the Internal Market Bill 
breach the human rights provisions in the Good Friday Agreement and could exclude uh, remedy through the courts. It also effectively, the, the withdrawal agreement had a line in it, which was about post-Brexit, there would be no diminution of rights. If the British government are going to end up walking away from the withdrawal agreement, that means that commitment to no diminution of rights could also go. The British government have made no secret of the fact that they want to get out of the European Convention of Human Rights. And that is an explicit commitment of the Good Friday Agreement. It's explicit that it has to be incorporated in the law for the North. So we're facing the difficulties this government brought forward this paper unilaterally. They brought forward in the knowledge that it would contravene the Good Friday Agreement and it would breach international law. And that brings me back to my original point, is that this is a government that has no skin in the game, no gra for the peace agreements or for Ireland and are quite obviously trying to either use it as negotiating leverage with the EU, or they're prepared for actually a worse scenario, not as just collapsing uh, the agreements. And just to then go back to the points that the, the issues that were extant that Michel Barnier raised are still extant in terms of the trade agreement. So there's talks going on at the minute about a trade agreement between the EU and Britain. The withdrawal agreement had been done and dusted, no hard border. It was the, the insurance mechanism for making sure that there'd be no hard border in Ireland and that Good Friday Agreement be protected. The trade agreement, there's been a number of pinch points on it. The first one was at the end of September, the Europeans said that if the British government didn't withdraw the offending parts of the inter inter internal markets bill, the day would begin legal proceedings, which they have now lodged. So th those came on the 1st of October. They sent a letter to the British government, which is the first phase of a legal action. Uh, the British government have four weeks to respond to that, and it ends up being caught in international law and tribunals and cases of that. The, the second pinch point was set by Boris Johnson, which was for the 15th of October. He said that there had to be an agreement by then or he was collapsing the talks. Interestingly, uh, yesterday he had a call with the EU Commission President and they agreed to extend it by a month, which brings you into the end of October, which was the deadline set by the European Commission for having an agreement, because if you leave it any longer than that, the Parliament wouldn't have the ability to ratify it and it wouldn't go through the process. And I suppose the ultimate cutoff date is the 31st of December, when the transition period lapses and there's no mandate, there's no provision post that. So an agreement has to be in place for the 1st of January. The Europeans had offered to extend that transition period, but the British government have declined and said no. So we're in a very precarious position in terms of what happens next. I think Mary Lou MacDonald it's summed it up well one time with us when she says the British government probably don't know actually what they're going to do next. They have created this chaos in the middle of a negotiation. Uh, and it's the, it could lead in the nightmare scenario to, as I say, the, a hard border come and being put in the, put into Ireland. Uh, the British government walking away from the withdrawal agreement or elements of it and a clash between Europe and Britain. But also fundamentally, it shows that the British government pay no regard to the Irish government or the parties in the north. And that's been the same with the issue of legacy. Uh, I think in terms of an ask, the immediate ask would be good to get some voices from Canada to raise their concerns. Canada's skin in the game on the Good Friday Agreement. And the ask is very simple, that in the middle, of, that the British government should commit to honouring international law and their agreements. It's crazy that you have to actually, that becomes the ask, that a sovereign state should actually abide by the agreement, which only was brought into law in February of this year. So I think that that's that, that's an immediate ask. Long term, it shows that this Westminster has no love for the the agreements, no concern for the prosperity of the North or the South, has no concern for the rights of citizens, North or South. 
And I think it shows that the Unity Project just makes sense in terms of there's a route back to the EU for Irish unity and it is better for the North to be able to control their own uh, economy as part of a, a united Ireland, as part of a Dublin parliament. So it just flags up again the choice that people are going to face is what union do they want to belong to? A union with Ireland and the EU or a union with Britain and the Little England of, of Westminster? I hope that's covered all of the bases and if there's any questions just uh -huh. um yeah just i wondered um uh, what effect uh, pelosi's statement uh threatening that there would be no no trade agreement with the, the us um uh did uh, the brits thinking well if trump gets back in we don't really care what they do or, or what what's the crack with that because she made a very powerful statement uh, yeah the, the reaction from the United States was swift and decisive. When you have Nancy Pelosi as the speaker, uh, raising the issue when you have people like Richie Neal, the chair of Ways and Means, and Elliot Engel, chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, as well as other uh, notable uh, Congress members, making clear the position. The, the British government's reaction, they sent Dominic Robb to Washington uh, to plead the case for Britain. And the United States has been very strong in this. And I think Britain actually realizes if they don't have a trade agreement with the EU and they force this, they breach the Good Friday Agreement, they will not have a trade issue with the US. And it's because the trade deal, of course, as people know, isn't, it goes through the White House, but it has to be passed by Congress and it has to be passed by the Senate. And Nancy Pelosi has been very clear that this isn't this is an issue which is not only bipartisan but by caramel. So that the this position of no trade agreement of the Good Friday Agreement is undermined is shared between the parties and between Congress and the Senate. So I think that's focused attention for Britain, and it's been a, a huge influence on where we go from here, and it, it's a bit of a game changer. And then, of course. The outworking of Dominic Raab being in Washington was that Joe Biden <laughs> then tweeted out his position in support of the Good Friday Agreement. And it's interesting to look at what the British lines have been. That they're telling people that they've brought in these provisions, but they're not actually going to use them. <laughs> now, no one brings in a piece of legislation, a set of powers that they have no view of using. They also say that they would be only used in the extreme. They're an insurance policy. And, and you have to ask an insurance policy for what? The withdrawal agreement is actually the insurance policy for protecting the Good Friday Agreement. So what they're effectively saying to the EU in the middle of a negotiation is, if you don't do what we say, we're going to have the powers to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. So that just completely undermines any negotiation of the political process. And I suppose the most invidious pieces where they've said that they are, they're doing this to protect the peace. Mm -hmm. The withdrawal agreement was not a threat to the peace process in any way, shape or form. The fact that even Arlene Foster and industry and business were coming in and said we need clarity became clear. Uh, and I've also said I went through how it doesn't even fit with the Good Friday Agreement. So the idea that they are protecting the Good Friday Agreement by bringing in these measures is insulting uh, to anybody in Ireland and anybody in Canada and anybody in the States who understand and support the Good Friday Agreement. So that's where we are with them, Kevin. It's, and I, I take no joy in saying that this is a British government. If this British government had been in place in 1998, there wouldn't be a Good Friday Agreement. And that's what we're, that's what we're dealing with now. Gabriel from Ottawa has a question. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Kieran. Um, you mentioned that the Europeans have uh, initiated a, a first step in a legal case uh, with Britain over their displeasure. Where is that legal case going to be resolved uh, if it, uh, a European case and going through European uh, ju uh, judges and, uh, and courts, uh, maybe the British would just step back and say, you know, we, we don't uh, recognise this court anymore? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, that, that's one of the concerning things. And the, I know that we have at least one solicitor on this and the legal process goes really slow. So they have just begun instigated infringement proceedings and they're governed actually by the withdrawal agreement, which the British government are trying to disapply elements of. So technically, and I and I 
someone could probably correct me, but I think it, the resolution ends up in the European courts. And that's because that's what was agreed in the withdrawal agreement, as far as I can remember. So that, uh, And I, I think watch the timing of it, because they have four weeks to respond, then there'll be further legal actions and these things won't be resolved quickly. And at the same time, just so you know, the bill that the British government have introduced, this internal markets bill, which does have the offending uh, parts in it, it passed through the Commons with uh, over 80, a majority of over 80. So it's not as if Boris Johnson's relying on unionists on this. This has got through and it's gone into the House of Lords. And there's been voices in the House of Lords opposing it. But constitutionally, the Commons can overrule the Lords eventually. So the timing of the timing of what happens with this internet, this internal relations, this internal market bill is completely dependent on what the British government wants. To do with it, and again, come back to you in the middle of a negotiation. So the so, second, I'll finish with this one. The second uh, question, Kieran, the, the internal market bill, uh, which uh, many of us have, uh, you know, have been uh, perplexed about, seems to have upset our Scottish friends, our Scottish nationalist friends, more than uh, others, and, and even the Plaid Cymru in, in Wales this week, because it's driving uh, a coaching force through their ideas of autonomy in the devolved assemblies that they have as well. So my question around that is, uh, do you think you see a, a future uh, relationship development uh, with our, our, our Celtic brothers in Scotland and Wales over their issues that are arisen out of this? Yeah, well, I, I think so. And the, the issues are very real because it gives British, it gives British ministers the powers to, just for the sake of it, if Scotland or the North or Wales decided to set environmental standards, a British minister could override those. On the basis of, on the basis of uh, regulations for the market, it also gives British government ministers the ability to directly fund into the institution, so that uh, they could use it to propagandize their own position. So there's there's issues in there that are fund their own pet projects. The bigger issue, the bigger issue about is about the future relationships across the island. Uh, we do have a, a strong relationship with the SNP, with the British Labour Party, of course. And even on Saturday, uh, Michelle Gilder, or Michelle O'Neill spoke at the Plaid Cymru conference and Mary Lou addressed it last year. So we do have good fraternal uh, relations with those other parties. And I'm always mindful that, in, particularly in Scotland, Scotland voted against Brexit as well and it's being imposed on them. And that creates all sorts of tensions within Britain, uh, which should come as no surprise that we are, we are for national democracies. We're for the sovereign rights of nations, you know, so that we would support the people of Scotland and the people of Wales to determine their own relationships. And uh, Sean Maloney out in Vancouver has a question. Folks, um, uh, thanks for those uh, those responses, Karen. My, my my question was also related to the Scottish National Party, and I wanted to ask you. Uh, it, or my first comment or observation would be that it seems like Nicola Sturgeon's kind of I'm enjoying watching her kind of like run circles around Boris um, in the management of, of coronavirus and so on. So it seems to me anecdotally that there's there's a growing uh, shift or support for for that movement. How influential or how beneficial is the advancement of Scottish nationalism in terms of a strategy or momentum for for Irish unity? Well, I, I mean, I think, again, it comes down to us having fraternal relations with them and on the basis of the rights of nations to determine their own government and have their own independence. Of course, we support Scotland's version of it. Uh, it's an issue for the future of Britain and the relationships within Britain. It, I mean, it, it's interesting that you have these movements and they're all based on the democratic principles that people voted against Brexit or people want their own national sovereignty, their own national parliament. So it'd be, be good for Turner Great. It, uh, relationships we would have them. They have the right to determine their own government, of course, and being their own nation. It, it doesn't. It wouldn't. It's, it doesn't impact in terms of our position in terms of Irish unity. You know, we've got the, the same rights, and in fact, we have a greater claim. Scotland has to secure a referendum. The right to a referendum. The right to a referendum is already is already secured for us in the Good Friday Agreement. It just needs to be enacted. So, yep, yeah, it's interesting to watch. Best of luck to our Scottish friends and our Welsh comrades and our Celtic cousins all. But we have a job of work as well to do in Ireland. And again, we have 
which those two nations don't have, we have an agreement which says there's a, a pathway to Irish unity. Mm-hmm. Scotland, Scotland depends on Westminster to grant them, a British Prime Minister to grant them a referendum. We have that already secured. Any other questions? So the um, it's going to be the quote of the year. Unmute yourself. Um, <laughs> I, I want to get back to what you were saying a bit earlier, Kieran, about the negotiations. I, I read somewhere, I don't know if it was off RTE, that um, someone was saying that the British had at this point left too much of the substantive subjects um, un, undiscussed for it to be feasible for them to arrive at an agreement, uh, even if they were acting in good faith, which they aren't. Um, do you know anything about that? It's as if for them it was like it's a foregone conclusion. They won't be able to get it done by the uh, end of the year. Well, I think because it's a live negotiation, there's always a chance of reaching an agreement. And it's been interesting, the conversation yesterday between Boris and uh, Van Leyden, where they flagged up the hope of having an agreement. But you're right. When Barney spoke three weeks ago, his key position was that the British government had not actually provided any papers on their approach to state aid, to fisheries, and to uh, dispute resolution. And... I mean, it was a, from our experience with British negotiators, they try to take everything down to the wire and hope that they will bounce people. So that, that could be part of the mechanism they're looking at. Uh, but they have left it extremely close. And it, that's the trade side. So if you get a trade agreement, by the way, most of the withdrawal agreement doesn't actually, isn't required because you've tariff-free trade. So the issues that has been flagged up, no longer be issued. So you want to get a trade agreement. Um, So the trade agreement's one side of it. The other thing that they've left it very late to be doing is putting together the processes for the withdrawal agreement. So like there has to be customs checks and checks at ports of entry in Belfast, Larn and Warren Point. They haven't been proceeding with those in time or in good faith is what Europe will say. So they are cutting it very close. And the, it's not just a problem for Ireland. If there's no trade deal, even with the trade deal, they are saying that Kent will be gridlocked in terms of traffic, trying to get to Dover. So the, the whole thing has been a mess in terms of Britain's handling with it, handling from it. Uh, you would hope that an agreement could be put in place, that the sense will prevail. But physically, it, actually doing the physical side of it, they've left it very late in terms of putting together the checks that are required and the infrastructure that's required. And they've left it extremely late to be dealing with the issues of state aid and fisheries. And I know that there was one report that says it was work had been done on fisheries, but state aid and the dispute resolution mechanisms. It, it sort of scares me to think we have come this far. And we're really no further on. Because it looks like Britain's in the driver's seat here, as far as I'm concerned. They've created disarray in negotiations. And we don't see if have anything to stop them from going any further. So we're no further on than we were 30, 40 years ago, as far as I'm concerned. Like, we haven't made any progress. And it doesn't look like we're going to make any the way Britain has created, and they have done this all down the years. And I don't know, with all the people that we have, we can't stop them. This is just something concerning to me. There's all this negotiation that's going on. They still seem to be in the driver's seat. So I don't know what we're going to do. Sorry. it's, It's as simple and as complex as this. They're going to have to leave. And I, yeah. and, and, and I mean, it's a very blase way to, to, to approach it, but the, the issue which is now facing people is, what is what, where do they see their future? And so people in Ireland are seeing what way the British government have dealt with Brexit, have dealt with the Irish government, have dealt with the parties. And the North is no longer the place that it was 20 or 30 years ago, Bernard. It's, I mean, it's fundamentally changed. Brexit, for example, 
See, the, and it, it, I think I'd said it at the, at the last time we were together. The Stormed Assembly, the Storm of Parliament was set up to be a unionist parliament for unionist people. Unionism is now a minority. The people who speak for the people in the North in terms of Brexit is Sinn Féin, the SDLP, the Alliance and the Green Party. That is the majority of votes in the Assembly. The, the Assembly voted to reject the British government's position. So all of those, that popular, that popular feeling is now across the board. The unionist majority is now gone. The ability of the British government to breach international law is now being questioned. They are now in the dock. It's not Irish Republicans who are in the dock. It's the British government who are in the dock. And we have a mechanism for achieving unity. I'm a bit, like you, I'm a bit cynical. While the British government claims some jurisdiction in the north, they will always exercise that part of their benefit. And it's our job to end that jurisdiction. And I think mm -hmm. over the past 40 years, if you look at where popular opinion is at, or if you look at where the, the support for Sinn Féin is at, if you look at where the support for the Republican position is, north and south, and if you look at what people are looking for, the future is actually Irish unity. So yes, that's where I think we end up going with this. And as a very like, if I'm an Irish Republican, I've always been an Irish Republican. I want to see a United Ireland. But as a new generation of people are now coming to the same conclusion for various different reasons. If you're a farmer and you're dependent on, on uh, CIP grants, your way back to Europe is through United Ireland. So that's where I think f the fundamental difference is. Uh, we now have a mechanism for to achieve Irish unity by peace, peaceful means. And not only have we got the mechanism, we've also got the support for it. Is, is it going to be easy? No. Is it going to happen tomorrow? No. But let's get Sinn Féin into an Irish government and let's make the difference there. Uh, as always, I have lots of questions. Um, you just touched on it. What about the Irish government at the moment? And uh, is it simply a question of Sinn Féin as opposition at this point, putting pressure on the Irish government? Uh, or, you know, is that something we can try and help with? Or are we kind of also waiting for the next election that hopefully Sinn Féin will then be in the government and that that's when things would move? Well, I, I, well, I think it's, it's both. The, the government that you have at the minute is a government of chaos. And I'm not saying that just for, I'm not saying that from a Sinn Féin perspective, but they've just messed, messed up everything that they've touched. Uh, there, in terms of it, it's just reeking off the cronyism that used to be there, the jobs for the boys, and it is mostly jobs for the boys, and their handling even of the pandemic has been a, a pretty poor. In terms of the unity piece, not to get too philosophical about it, but I think it's yet this becomes you get closer to it and becomes the real deal. You start peeling back the rhetoric of republicanism for parties like Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael in their leaderships. And what you find out is their commitment to Irish unity is wafer thin. So at this time, whenever Britain is breaching international laws, is breaching the Good Friday Agreement, is threatening to impose a hard border, is not listening to the Irish government, Micheál Martin cannot mention the words Irish unity mm. or United Ireland. And I think that's the fundamental, that, but that, that, that political Leadership, the people who have prospered under partition don't represent the Irish nation and don't represent even the people in the 26 counties in this. They are looking on and saying, no, the future is unity. So I think that that's going to be the big ask for us. What we will do in opposition is we, we will keep the Irish governments uh, foot to the flame in terms of unity, in terms of progressing the argument, in terms of protecting the Good Friday Agreement and be sure that if it was a Sinn Féin, Taoiseach or Sinn Féin or government, we would be planning for Irish unity and we would be promoting Irish unity and we would be open for the discussion on Irish unity and we'd be talking about it and the future of a new and united Ireland. Mm -hmm. And that's what we'd be at. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kieran.